Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the Emlois Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program. What I have on this slide is what we call the electromagnetic spectrum. Even if you never uh, use those words to refer to the phenomena listed in the slide, uh, what you see there are, are things that we are very familiar with in our common life. Uh, you see radio waves here. These are the piece of, this is the piece of the electromagnetic spectrum that is used to, uh, for, for radios to receive. Uh, we can listen in the morning to AM and FF, FM radio. We have here <coughs> microwave, and these are, this is the region of the electronic spectrum that you, is used for GPS, for example, and other matters. Uh, then we go to infrared light ovens, furnaces, to the visible spectrum, which is the one that allows you to see me and me to see you. And then we move on to ultraviolet light. This is the bad light that you shouldn't take in the summer. X-rays, gamma rays. And what is remarkable about all these phenomena is that they can be put together in a very small set of equations that we know as Maxwell's equations. And even if you don't understand the mathematics, this is not important at this point. What is rather amazing is that all of these phenomena, from radio waves to gamma rays to X-rays and the visible, can be described by these four equations and nothing else. And the person who managed to put all this together was a Scott man, James Clerk Maxwell. There is his picture in there. And this happened more than 150, nearly 150 years ago. So I want to call your attention to only two things of those equations. If you notice, there are only three letters, E, B, and J. J stands for the current. Then there is a rho, which stands from the char density. But the important things in there are the E and the B. Now, the E is for the electric field, and the B is for the magnetic field. Now, why Maxwell chose B for the magnetic field? Apparently, it's because he started with all the letters of the alphabet. He had lots of variables to name. Uh, he went A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and B stuck with the magnetic field. So we left the M for magnetization. So B is magnetic field here. So we have the electric field and we have the magnetic field. And this is a very complex concept, the concept of a field because we have something that exists even when there is nothing there. The nothing is what we call the vacuum. But try to imagine this room as being full of electricity. Not the electricity you're familiar with, the runs in cables and all of that. But something that is all, everywhere. Visible light, we emit also infrared radiation. The radiation that comes into your cell phones that allow you to talk to somebody else. This is soon going to be a mystery for everybody how these things work, right? Isn't it amazing that you go tick and somebody on the other side of the planet picks up that and talks to you? It's, it's remarkable, right? And again, all these things go back to this set of four equations that were discovered 150 years ago. So when we talk about the electromagnetic field, we talk about something that is like electricity, but in addition, magnetricity, that is everywhere. 
It's moving everywhere and everybody's in time, everybody's in position, surrounds us everywhere. Actually, it surrounds space everywhere. And there is the electric field and the magnetic field. So, the electric field is the bad and the good guy. Is the one that couples and interacts strongly with matter. This is the one. This is the one that can burn you in the summer, produces lightning, hits up your foot in a microwave oven, allows you to see the laser beam right there, and it's the one that ultimately interacts with your cell phone and allows you to talk to this other person on the other side of the world. The magnetic field, on the other hand, is the weak partner here. The magnetic field, essentially, we are essentially transparent to the magnetic field. Notwithstanding what you may have heard in the popular press. The magnetic field is something that goes through us and doesn't do very much, unless, of course, it's extremely large, or the particles that make us are moving at a speed close to the speed of light, which is not the case. So unless things move extremely fast, or the fields are extremely large, the magnetic field does very little to us. And when I said the popular press, you may remember the story of people living close to power lines that were afraid of being affected by these magnetic fields, right? Magnetic fields are transparent. Nevertheless, there are magnetic phenomena. We are all used to magnets and solenoids and aurora borealis and, and these uh, uh, spheres that spin around. And when I say that the magnetic field is transparent, I mean specifically things that happen at high frequencies, very rapidly in time. Of course, all of this is relative. If the fields become very large, then you have to watch out. But, for example, and let's, let me make a clear statement here, the fields that interact with you when you are turning on the cell phone are not going to hurt you. They are very weak, extremely weak fields in there. So another thing I want to tell you about these electromagnetic fields is that they behave very, very differently, far away from the sources, from the way they behave very close to the sources. So in physics and engineering, we talk about the near field zone. So this is supposed to be an emitter of radiation, an antenna that is emitting radiation through space. So the near field zone, zone is the zone that is very close to the sources. The source that is close by about the wavelength of the radiation. And the wavelength of the radiation is essentially how long it takes for the field to repeat itself. This is the wavelength. And wavelength and frequency they are two things closely related. Actually, one is inversely proportional to the other. The higher the wavelength, the shorter the frequency. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. And I didn't say that before, I should have. The only difference between radio waves and X-rays is the frequency. There is no other difference until you get to quantum mechanics. But classically, and Maxwell's equations are classical equations, treat the same way X-rays as they treat radio waves or microwaves and any other wave. The difference again is radio waves are very slow waves, very low frequency, X-rays are very high frequencies, very short wavelengths. So, in the far field zone, which is far away, far away means a couple of wavelengths from the emitter, E and B love each other. <laughs> they not only love each other, they cannot live without the other. If there is a E, there is a B, if there is a B, there is an E. There is nothing you can do about it. You can't have one without the other. This is what we call the radiation zone. And I should mention here that the word radiation that is used in science and engineering is not the same way we use it in the common language where radiation tends to mean nuclear radiation. This has nothing to do with nuclear radiation. This is electromagnetic radiation. And the light that comes to your eyes and my eyes is electromagnetic radiation, and we can live with that 
without worrying too much. On the other hand, in the near field zone, things are very different. You can have an E field alone, that's the strong field, or you can have a B field alone. So in the near field zone, you can make a field that looks primarily electric-like or magnetic-like, or both. And as we go into the business of transmitting power, you want to do it using a field that is predominantly magnetic, because as I said before, magnetic fields go through our bodies without hurting us, to a large extent. Okay. So what this talk is about is two different phenomena that are closely related, as I hope I will convince you in the talk. The first question is, how small a spot we can make using monochromatic, monochromatic means one color, one frequency, electromagnetic radiation. And the other question is, how safely can we transmit power wireless, in a wireless form. So, let's start first with wireless power transfer. Have you ever thought about wireless power transfer? Well, look around here. We are surrounded by cables, batteries. Everywhere we go, we have to carry these heavy things that are transformers to get from if you want to light a lamp, you have to run a cable somewhere. But in principle, you don't need to do that. In principle, the same way that we are now used to receive data in a wireless form, we could receive power in a wireless form. But of course, we have to do it in a way that doesn't hurt us and doesn't hurt everything else. Now the future of this, which may be coming sooner than later, is to get rid of all this. Get rid of the cables, get rid of the batteries, so that when you enter a room or you go to a conference, you don't worry to check if your laptop has enough juice to work during the day, or if your cell phone is going to run empty after a couple of hours. So what I want to do here is to show you some possibilities out there that are being developed to make this a reality. The question, the story of wireless power transfer goes back to Nikola Tesla. So Tesla was a visionary, very smart person that thought many years ago about many things. Uh, by the way, Tesla is the guy to whom we owe um, AC currents. Edison wanted DC, Tesla wanted AC and AC won. This is what happened. But among many other things that Tesla wanted to do was to provide wireless power to the world. And the tower you see there is, is the one he used as a prototype, the one there, to emit power so that anybody in the world could pick up and used to power up everything, lights, engines, things like that, and cell phones. <laughs> so this was around 1890, and, and, and the Tesla coil, which is sitting over there, and I'll show you in a minute how it works, is, is one of the things that Tesla designed. To do that, uh, I'm going to show you a mini version of the big tower that is here. Now Tesla, had this, this uh, I don't know, a great or grandiose idea of doing so, uh, because of one particular reason that I don't know, is something that is not well known. The, the Earth has some natural electromagnetic frequencies, and they exist because the ionosphere and the surface of the Earth make like two mirrors and form like a cavity within which electromagnetic radiation can propagate around the Earth. And actually, you can 
do that in your backyard. You can put something in there and measure the natural frequencies of Earth. These are things we know today as Schumann resonances, thanks to the work of Mr. Schumann in 1950s. But Tesla was aware, 50 years earlier, at least of the existence of the fundamental resonance. And this is kind of shown on the upper right corner in there. This is essentially acting like two mirrors, and you see radiation going around. So Tesla's idea was to put right there a tower that would emit power all around Earth, and all you needed to do for free is to put an antenna and get the power, suck the power, a receiver, and power up whatever you wanted. Now, so let me now move on to the first intermission here. This is a small version of the Tesla coin. I'm trying to do something that will make this lecture viral in the internet. <laughs> Electrocution <laughs> effect. <laughs> Let's. Yeah. Good work. So this is clearly wireless, right? I, I don't believe it is safe. <laughs> so Tesla project died because of lack of funding. But I don't believe that this system would have been a good idea for humanity. So let's move on to the other piece of the story. So that was wireless. Now I'm going to tell you about imaging and focusing. So what I have here are two images of a set of bacteria on the left and stars on the right. And this is something that people in optics deal with all the time. You want to make a sharper image and you want to distinguish as much as possible so that you can tell that if in that picture on the left you have 27 bacteria or 205, and if on the right you have two stars, so three or four or five. The point here is that there is a fundamental limit of resolution. This is how we call it optics. No matter how good your system is, no matter how great your lenses are, there is a limit to that. And that limit is known as the standard diffraction limit. I will tell you in a minute what it's all about. Very much related to this is the question of how sharp a focus you can make. And again, there is a limit. No matter how good your lens is, no matter how hard you try, at the end of the day, the size of the focus, I'm anticipating what I'm about to say, cannot be smaller than the wavelengths of the radiation you're using. You can make that better than that. So uh, several people uh, work on this, but we uh, associate this with the name of Ernst Abbe, who was a German scientist working in Carl Zeiss Optics. He was one of the founders of Carl Zeiss. It's a company that still exists today. And there is a microscope that he used. And what Abbe was interested in is in the following question. If I have two little objects separated by a distance d, how small can d be before I can no longer tell if I have one or two? And this is what we know as the standard diffraction limit that says that the distance between them can be at best lambda. You cannot do better than that. And very quickly, there is another name that appears in relation to this, that's, th this was 1870, by the way. Uh, Lord Riley is a very famous physicist, contemporary of uh, Abe. Um, he wrote for the first time something we call the Rayleigh criterion. He was more interested in a related question, which is the telescope. W what is the resolution of the telescope? And, and it's also limited by what we call today diffraction effects. So what you see in the picture here, you see two stars, but if they get too close and eventually you don't know if it is two or one. 
And these limitations are physical limitations that no matter, are, these are fundamental laws. There's nothing you can do about them. You, you have to live with them and uh, to, yeah. So this was 1890 something. Okay, so there is a laser. I was talking about imaging, but the same applies to trying to focus a beam. So there is the focus of a laser, and I will show you in a minute uh, a demo about that. And no matter how hard you work, no matter what tricks you play, there's a fundamental law that says that the size of the spot cannot be made smaller than the wave of the radiation. So this is not a big deal if you're trying to kill ants with a magnifying glass, <laughs> because visible light has a very small wavelength, and the ants are bigger than the wavelength of the light. But if you're talking about uh, radio waves that are depicted on the right, where the wavelength can be hundreds of meters or 30 meters, you see the problem. If you want to focus radiation that has wavelength of 1,000 feet, you need to do something else. And this is sort of what I will be telling you about. Uh, just here. Yeah. Uh, you see a little spot on the, on the screen in there? I'm moving it now. You know, I can work very, very hard. This is not monochromatic light. This is white light. But nevertheless, you know, if this were the best lens in the world, the spot would still be larger than the wavelength of the light. So this is a better lens here. You know, the manual always says, ah, there it is, thanks, Monica. <laughs> you see, it's smaller than the other one, right? And you can work again as hard as you want. It's very small. But if you could look in there with a super device, it would still be bigger than lambda, and you can try a laser beam and you know it looks even if I can see it a little better there I see here I don't know I don't see it in the screen because it's black and white and it's very intense this is another problem but the point is no matter what you do no matter what you do is going to be bigger than that so having said all this let's go back to our picture of the electromagnetic field far field Near field. What I told you and what Abbe did and Rayleigh did applies only to the far field. It is in the far field that you cannot make a spot smaller than lambda. In the near field, on the other hand, there is no physical reason as to why we cannot do that. Nothing prevents us from the physical laws to make a spot as small as you wish. You can make a spot using radio waves that is only a micron with size. We have known this for a very long time. The question as many things is how to do it. And I will tell you how to do it in a minute. But let me summarize what I have said so far. It is in the near field if you're interested in wireless power transfer and other things, that you can have a field that is predominantly magnetic. It looks almost like magnetostatics. And it's in the near field that you can have spots that are very small compared with lambda. And these are the kind of things that you need when you think about making a practical implementation of wireless power transfer. How near is near? I've been using the word near field. Well, there is again the electromagnetic spectrum that goes from radio waves, visible, x-rays, UV. Remember, frequency increases this way, wavelength increases this way. And here are some numbers. If you're interested in gigahertz, that's the frequency of your GPS, you're talking about a wavelength like this. So the near field is about this big. And this is where you could make a wireless power transfer that certainly is not going to be very good for humans. You need something bigger than that. On the other hand, if you work at 100 megahertz, you are talking about 10 feet. But if you are talking about 500 kilohertz, 
you're talking about almost half a mile. Now that's starting to sound like something that could be useful for us. Now, in some applications, you may want to have a very small near field, some other speakers. On the other hand, if you use very, very low frequencies, like 10 hertz, the wavelength is comparable to the radius, to the circumference of Earth, and this is the Tesla idea to, to make a system of wireless. But there, the electric field was too high. It's not a good idea. All right, the question is, how to do it, right? So the physical law is, allows us to do it. The question is how to do it. So again, there are these two pieces, imaging, how to image something, and how to focus something. In the far field, you cannot image things that are closer than the wavelength, and you cannot focus things closer than the wavelength. In the far field, you can do it. How to image things in the near field is something that has been done for a while. I'm putting here copies of some very famous papers. And the first one is from the 70s, Ash and Nichols. And the trick to see things that are smaller than the wavelength is very simply the following. You grab a screen, put a teeny tiny hole, and move the screen around. And you put your eyes very close to the, to the hole. If the screen is very close to the object, then you are going to see features that are smaller than the wavelength. And this is the principle of near field optics and near field everything. It's a scanning method, so you come on something, say this, suppose I want to do a near field system that works at microwaves. Remember, the microwave wavelength is like this. Okay? So if I put this much closer than the wavelength, and I put a little hole in here, and I put my eyes there, assuming my eyes are sensitive to microwaves, but we can put detectors, and I move it all around, I am going to see very small features in there. So this is the principle of near field optics. And lately, there has been an enormous uh, expansion in the field, and there are basically two ways to do that. One is the one I told you, which is the one on the left. It's called aperture near field. And if you want to do optics, you grab fiber optics, you taper the fiber and make a teeny tiny hole, and then you move the fiber all over the map. This is how near field optics works. Or you can have what is known as aperture-less near field optics, which is a very sharp point that you move around your object, and that little point serves as an antenna that picks up radiation that gets emitted, and that's how it works. So we know how to do imaging in the near field. What we don't know, or didn't know until about 10 years ago, is how to do focusing on the near field. Now, things change a lot when in 2000, John Pendry, now he's Sir John Pendry, uh, came up with a, an idea that many people thought was absolutely crazy. The idea was to use, instead of a material that has normal positive refraction, to use something that has negative refraction. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. And he showed mathematically, around 2000, that's the title of his paper, Negative Refraction Makes a Perfect Lens. So there is negative refraction. I'll talk more about it in a minute. And it's, it's negative because those of you who remember ray tracing from your physics class, rays don't do that usually. You see, they don't go up and turn down. They, they move in that direction. I'll talk to that in a minute. So this is negative refraction. And what he showed was that if you had a material that exhibited that property, then you get perfect focus. And let me show you a little video of how the process works. So what you have here, so the, the orange lines delegate the region where you have negative refraction. And this is a source. You see, this is a little point that is emitting electromagnetic radiation. Once they get into the area where I have negative refraction, you notice the waves are backward? They go backward. 
And then finally, on the other side, and that little white spot in there, you're going to start seeing the focus. And in time, the focus gets sharper and sharper and sharper. And if you wait sufficiently long time, you get a perfect image. Right? There is starting to happen. There it goes. You see the meter, the backward waves, and the image. So let me talk about positive and negative refraction. This is positive refraction. You see how the rays go? This is negative refraction. They bend the other way around. And this is what the waves do. On the left, you see what the rays do. On the right is what the waves do. And as you saw in a, minute, a minute ago with the tape, in negative refraction, inside the slab, the waves go backwards. Now, this negative refraction thing, this, uh, this is a little technical here, uh, was shown in the 60s, actually. And, and probably other people showed that earlier than Veselago, a Russian physicist Veselago that the necessary conditions for negative refractions are, and continue to be, the two parameters of the material be negative. One is the permittivity, that's the epsilon in there, and the other is the permeability, magnetic permeability. To have a material with negative permittivity is not a big problem. Essentially all metals at low frequencies have negative permittivity. Negative permeability is a different matter. As a matter of fact, we don't know of any natural substance, with perhaps one or two exceptions, that do that. So this is, by the way, what positive and negative refraction would look like if you could find a liquid that exhibited negative refraction on the right. However, is not available in nature. <laughs> so in the past 10 years, there have been enormous resources put into making an artificial material that shows negative refraction. And one of the reasons why this was done is because of Pendry's idea that if you had a material with negative refraction, you can focus light to essentially infinite resolution, or close to that. So that was one of the drivers. So I'm going to show you the last demo now. And two things are things that we have done before. And one is something that has never been tried before. So we'll see what happens here. So this is a, this is a different way from Tesla. This is just emitting waves. Ah, there you go. You see, this is wireless, right? There are no wires, OK. And it's polarized, because as what I will show you in a minute, you see, depending on the angle, it turns on and off. OK? Again, this is a far field way of doing wireless power transfer. And as such, it's OK unless you start getting to very high powers, in which case it becomes unsafe. All right? So thank you. OK, so what I have here is an acoustic version of negative refraction. I'm sorry, positive refraction. The negative refraction comes later. So let me first show you the, uh, the ripple tank. So these are now not electromagnetic waves, but acoustic waves. And the rays that I showed in, uh, before are perpendicular to those waves. So you see the waves are going from bottom to the top. So the rays would be arrows that point upward in this case. And the, the reason we can see these waves, they are moving around, is because this is a strobe light. And I can make, I can stop the waves. I can make them, there you go. By changing the strobe frequency, I can even stop them or make them go back. Something like that. Okay, 
let's, let's leave them there. So now I'm going to put another material, and you're going to see how the waves change directions, which is the same as saying refract, when they hit a different material. So I'm going to put here the other material, which is a piece of, of glass. And I think from the back it's easier to see. But you see the different angle inside? That's refraction. And that's positive refraction. That's conventional refraction. If the glass would have negative refraction, they will be going in a 90 degrees away from that or a different angle, very different. So the reason I want to show you this is because the one thing we haven't tried before is to show negative refraction with sound. And we have the demo coming up in there. And this is something that would be impossible to show you with electromagnetic radiation because we can make negative refraction at microwaves, but you cannot see microwaves. And we cannot make negative refraction in the optical regime. We don't know how to do that. We could up to one micron, perhaps. But still, we cannot see one micron radiation. So uh, the one thing that I haven't shown yet is the uh, just conventional refraction, um, so that you see in a demo what I've been telling you about. So this is a big piece of material. And I want to show you that when light goes through there, it refracts. It changes its direction. So all I need to do is to get the laser. Uh, we need some powder or smoke or something. So. Okay, so let's see if you can see the beam here. You see the beam there? And you see that it changes direction inside. That's refraction. You can also see reflection in there. But reflection, the angle doesn't change, right? I'm sorry, the, the, yeah, the angle doesn't change. So maybe here you can see it better. But you, you notice the change in angle, right? Okay, that's refraction. So again, if this material were a negative material, the beam inside would go the other way around, would, would go towards me instead of going away from me. All right? OK, so we have a demo here that consists, this is a crystal of soda cans. If you want to publish work in this area in a prestigious journal, you call it a phononic crystal. <laughs> but that's what it is. We are going to use sound with a wavelength of about this big. So that's why we need something big. And the silver cans have one interesting property. They have a resonant frequency. You know like those crystal glasses that when they open a single thing, they break? Well, the cans are not going to break, but they also have their natural frequency. And there is a, here there is a one can to show that there is a resonance at about 400 hertz. So this is going to be a little noisy. It's up there. So uh, is, is about in that frequency? Yeah, it's about that frequency. So if I increase the amplitude. I don't know how well, ah yeah, it's over there. You see, there is the resonance. What I'm measuring here is how the can moves, and if anybody wants to come and touch the can, you're gonna feel it, it's, it's moving like that. That's the resonance. If I change the frequency to, you see, it went down completely, the amplitude of vibration. If I change it uh, to the other side, goes up and down again. So that's a resonance. So when you hit the right frequency, the can starts to move a lot. So what I want to show you here is what happens with now a collection of cans when we hit it very close to the resonance and away from the resonance. 
This is not, this is a disclaimer here, this is not exactly negative refraction. And yet, it mimics quite well the behavior of a negative refraction crystal, in that if you are away from resonance, this behaves like a normal refraction. Light, sound in this case, when the sound hits the surface of this crystal, is going to go this way. Okay, so this is roughly what we have there, right? More or less. This is the normal here. So when sound hits here, this is conventional refraction. It moves away from the normal. When it goes this way, it's negative refraction. Okay, we are ready. So over there, you see the spectrum of sound. Actually, it's impossible to show one frequency here because this is an extremely sensitive mic that picks up everything. My movement, my talking, everything in there. But you have to see out of all these noise in there, the frequency at which this is our emitter here. This is there. You see there the top peak at around 350? That's the one you have to look at. And right now, we are, can we stay away from the resonance? So this is too close to resonance. So if we go away from resonance. If this gets too loud, feel free to just plug your ears. <laughs> right. You see the peak in there? And now the question is, where is the beam going to go through the crystal of soda cans? And we are trying to pick up the backs. So where should we be? Right there. We are changing two things at the same time to confuse you. So she's trying to find which angle the sound is strongest. And it's somewhere around there, right? You see the major peak? Unfortunately, the scale is logarithmic. So it's hard to pick up when it's going. Let's say around there. Now, if we go away from the resonance, it's going to be somewhere else. So where is it there? So now we are trying to find the position at which the refracted beam is met. Where is it? Uh, for that one? Uh -huh. That would be... Somewhere there? All right. You get the idea. So it's a very different position. And if you trace the rays in there, you convince yourself that one is positive and one is negative. All right? Thanks. It worked. It has never been tried before. Thanks. All right. So. Okay, I, I am going to go fairly fast through this because it's, it's about 20 after the hour. Uh, this has to do more about the history of negative refraction. Uh, when Pendry uh, published that paper, he received a lot of criticism. And look at the title of that, Negative Reaction to Negative Refraction. It's a cute title in there. And for those of you who uh, uh, I, I'm a little more technical. The, 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 the problem with Pendry's paper is that he worked in a re, for values of this permittivity to permeability that are singular, mathematically speaking. So what Pendry did was to take a very complicated expression and the zero times infinity divided by zero divided by infinity and he got the right number, <laughs> which is something that 
you really have to understand physics a lot to get it right. He got it right. But it took a long time for everybody, including myself, to believe it. Um, so, and many, many papers. I mean, there were like 20 papers criticizing his work. So, uh, this is a paper I wrote now in 2003. And, and as uh, the same work was done by the group of Graham Milton at, in Utah. So we both work independently for each other. And what we were able to do is to come up with this expression, which don't, you don't need to understand or, or know. It's a complicated expression. But it was an expression that defined the field of the negative refraction slab. Now, once you have an analytical expression, things get easier. You cannot argue anymore. Either you do the math right, or it's right. <laughs> so, as, as this is a bit of a funny thing, at least it's funny to me, the paper I submitted was received November 10, 2003, and it was accepted January 7, <laughs> 2003. And if you go and check the literature, this is true. And of course, the joke is backward waves, negative refraction. <laughs> Right. <laughs> All right. So anyhow, uh, these are some pictures I want to show you around negative refraction that are very, very strange. So anybody who has work in optics and knows a little about interference and diffraction will immediately recognize these pictures as being due to, for example, the one here, the one on the lower left, looks like textbook example of diffractions through a small hole. Uh, you see all these patterns in here, the periodicity here, the periodicity there. The only difference between this and conventional optics is that this is all in the near field. And I realize I'm being a little technical here. So there are no waves here. This is all static. And nature works in a way to produce a pattern that looks almost identical to what you would get in the far field. So this is what I call radiationless interference. There is no radiation. You're not summing waves to get interference, and yet the picture looks like interference. So anyhow, this is a plot of the electric field that comes out of one of these negative refraction slabs. And this is the focal plane in here. And for the experts here in the audience, this is a logarithmic scale, because the waves are evanescent. They decay away. This is the near field. So as I told you before, for a long time, we asked the question, how does it work? How this super focusing works? But now that we have this expression, mathematical expression, that looks very complicated, and you don't need to understand or care about it, we know how it works. And it's very simple. At the end of the day, it's very simple. The pattern here has to be periodic and with some modulation. So once we knew this, it became, the following became clear. You either have a negative index slab that produces this pattern, or you find something else that produces the same pattern, and you're going to have perfect focus. The two things are equivalent. It doesn't matter. Whatever we do, if we get a field that looks like this here, we will get perfect focus in there. And finally, this is the picture I started my talk about. This is the logarithmic scale picture that the community used for many, many years until we realized that things look significantly easier if we plot things this way. And you see very clearly here the focus, right there. This is the super focus. In this picture, the wavelength is 100 times bigger than the distance of this. This is the super focus. So this brings us to the near field plates. And this is a concept developed here in collaboration with Professor Anthony Grivick from the WE department here at Michigan. So the idea was fairly simple. Once we understood the negative refraction slab, it became clear how to make this happen. How to do it? Well, we have to replace this slab by a device that produces the same pattern as the slab. 
And we knew how to do that. This is another paper I wrote at some, part, some point. These are examples of focusing. You go from here, it focuses, out of focus. Focus, out of focus. But I can see that a little better here. This is my antenna. This is my negative index slab. This is the pattern. This is what a negative index slab would do for you. But we don't have negative index slab except a microwave they had to make, etc., etc. So the idea we had was to replace that by this, something we called the near-field plate, which produced the same pattern. So that was all. Now, what we knew was the secret as to how to pattern the plate to get this, because we had the expressions to do that. So we did it a couple of years ago. We did a plate that works in the microwave that I didn't bring from my office. I meant to bring it here. I left it in my office, but that's a picture of it, which is something that looks like this. It's a strip that you put in front of a, an emitter, and you get, this is Tony Gribbick, and you get this. So this is experimental data, and this is the focus, and the focus is 20 times smaller than the wavelength of the radiation. Definitely way beyond the standard diffraction limit. And the field it produced was magnetic-like. Remember, in the near field can be magnetic or electric. Actually, the near fields allow you to do either one. You can have an electric-like or a magnetic-like, at wish, whatever you want. We can do that. Uh, not long after, uh, Tony uh, made the point version of this. The one we did before was a line, focus, line focus. Then he did the point, there is the paper. And this was lambda over 15. And you can do anything, lambda over 100, whatever you want. The smaller it is, the harder you have to work. So this brings us to nearly the end of my talk. This was electric field like. To tell you a little about applications. What are the things good for? Well, once you have a very small spot, then you can think about doing many, many things you couldn't do with a big spot. For example, you can do sensing or probing. So you have something in there, could be an electric circuit, could be bacteria, could be anything you want. So you put it in the focus of this near field plate and you move the thing around to get a picture. And you have the advantage that you have a distance. You, you don't need to, to, to touch the things, right? There is a distance that you can work with. You can also make antennas. Now you can focus the thing here, put your radio, your TV, whatever you want in there, in the near field. Or you can do wireless power transfer. Now we have something that looks magnetic. It's kind of collimated. Well, let's use it to power up things. This is primarily going to work at radio microwave frequencies. Once you go to higher frequencies, as usual, things get harder. There is no reason why we couldn't make this at terahertz frequencies. Terahertz frequencies, by the way, are used in the devices when you go to an airport and they scan you and they see through and all of that. That's not x-rays, that's terahertz. They are not gonna hurt you. Um, and once you go to optical regime, it gets harder and harder because remember, the higher the frequency, the smaller the wavelength, so then the features you have to make have to be smaller and smaller. And once you reach 100 angstroms, 200 angstroms, once you reach the size of 100 atoms, things get really hard. But nowadays, we can draw features on the order of 20, 30 angstroms, which when you think about it, is about the size of 10, 20 atoms. You can do that with lithography. So these are the near field plates I've been telling you about. It's not the only technology available to do wireless power transfer. Um, this is another one. This is an MIT uh, idea. What they use there is resonant magnetic coupling. It's very different than the technology of near field plates. So what they do is they have 
this is the emitter and this is the receiver and they are identical and what they have is they have again a little technical here an inductor and a capacitor that form a resonant circuit and this is resonantly you can transfer energy from here to here the field of this looks like the field of a magnetic dipole where the lines go up and down notice the contrast between the field here and the field there which is focus so one of the applications you can think of of, of wireless technology is to charge batteries of pacemakers for example you may not know you may know already that the only way to replace a battery is to have an operation nowadays well there is no reason in principle uh, technical that we could not do that in a wireless fashion there is a third technology that is inductive coupling that is the technology that you use in some of the uh, stoves right inductive coupling so the technology there is similar not exactly uh, as your wireless toothbrush many of you use already wireless toothbrush for charging and this is something that uh, anyhow all of these technologies share one thing in common they are near field you can make them predominantly magnetic and therefore safe within some reason and uh, is very close I don't know how close to the market Wytricity is the company that uh, is, is uh, behind this technology. Zondas is the company behind the Neafield Place, and PowerMat is the one behind inductive coupling. So we'll see what happens in the next uh, few days here. So let me summarize. I told you about the electromagnetic field, the E and the B, the electric and the magnetic field. I told you about these two very different regions where the fields behave very differently. In the near field, in the near field you can separate E and B. In the far field you can. I tell you a wireless power transfer and magnetic is okay, is safe, within limits. I told you about AB and the diffraction limit and the message. I hope uh, I was able to transmit to you that the spot size size is always larger than the wavelength in the far field, but there are no restrictions in the near field. I told you about the perfect lens based on negative refraction and practical implementations and other applications. Thank you very much for your attention. Saturday Morning Physics is sponsored by the M. Lewis Tiffany Endowment, the Hideko Tomazawa Endowment, the Physics Department, and by gifts from friends of the program.